Jij hint, get on first warmly thank our friends from the Child Art Cultural Group for coming to Netaji Pabon this evening and performing the opening music. To eternally rousing immortal compositions by our Bidrohi Kobi, Kaji Nojrul Islam. Kaji Nojrul Islam is only slightly younger than Netaji. And the Bidrohi Kobi's 125th birth anniversary falls this year in May 2024. As a mark of commemoration, we had exactly 125 singers in the Chayanot Chorus today, rendering Durga Mugiri, Kantar Moru, and Kararui Noho Kopat. Thank you again. And <clears throat> on behalf of Netaji Research Bureau, I very much hope that you will come back here and perform a full concert this year, sometime this year, not just opening music. Today we have gathered for the Shishir Kumar Bose Lecture 2024. In January 2002, that is just over two decades ago, the historian Ronojit Guho delivered a memorable Netaji oration from this dais in this very space on 23rd January 2002. The Netaji oration was a yearly lecture in Netaji's honor, which was started by Dr. Shishir Bose, the founder director of Netaji Research Bureau here in 1957, from the year 1961 onwards. And for the first two decades, two to three decades, the Netaji oration provided a platform for hearing and recording the experiences of many, indeed most, of Netaji's close companions in struggle in the Azad Hind movement during the Second World War. So for example, the very first Netaji oration was delivered right here on 23rd January 1961 by Mr. S. A. Ayer, the Minister of Publicity and Propaganda in the Arsi Hukumat e Azad Hind, the Provisional Government of Free India, declared by Netaji in Singapore, as you all know, on 21st October 1943. In later decades, particularly from the 1990s onwards, uh, many luminaries from different professions and fields, including very renowned, globally famous academicians, delivered the Netaji oration from this dais on 23rd January. So, for example, in 1997, Netaji's birth centenary year, the Netaji oration was delivered by the Palestinian scholar and public intellectual, Edward W. Said, Edward Said. And five years later, in 2002, it was Ronjit Guho's turn. Let me read out to you the first paragraph of Ronjit Guho's Netaji oration, Nationalism and the Trials of Becoming. Nationalism and the Trials of Becoming. <clears throat> he said, The Netaji Research Bureau has done me a singular honor by inviting me to join you 
at these celebrations of Netaji's 105th birthday. A birthday anniversary is always the occasion for renewal, as Rabindranath has taught us to think. One of his last lyrics on this theme speaks of all such renewals as the articulation of life's triumph. In paying our homage this evening to a historic instance of life's triumph, let us invoke the spirit of the new by reading once again the story of that life as told by Netaji himself in his autobiography. Ranoji Guho framed his Netaji oration around a quite brilliant uh, analysis of Netaji's autobiography, Shubhashin Rabos, an Indian pilgrim. In my own reading of that text, An Indian Pilgrim, Bharat Potik, I am deeply indebted <clears throat> to its first editor, the late Dr. Shishikumar Bos, who had passed away shortly before Ranjit Guho came here. Uh, Dr. Shishir Bos died on the evening of 30th September 2000, and even on that day, he died at 8 p.m. in the evening at our home, Boshunhara, 90 Shorodos Road, a couple of kilometers from here. Throughout that day, uh, he worked at Netaji Research Bureau, as he did every day of his life. And uh, he had just finished in the evening uh, seeing his little patients uh, when uh, he suddenly had a heart attack and passed away. In my own reading of that text, Ranjit Guho says, I am deeply indebted to its first editor, the late Dr. Shishir Kumar Bose. Much of what I know of Netaji's life and times owes very largely to Shishir Kumar's work as a historian and an archivist. I dedicate this lecture to his memory. Um, well, that's quite a tribute. Um, Dr. Shishir Bose, as a historian and an archivist, he was that. Uh, he was even more than that, a museologist and a curator who established the world-class Netaji Museum, also in 1961, on the first and second floors of Netaji Bhabon, uh, that hundreds of thousands come to see, pay homage. It's a site of pilgrimage for people all over India. Every year, we have hundreds of thousands of visitors. He was a historian, an archivist, a curator, a museologist, all self-taught, self-trained, and self-motivated. Because it was his <clears throat> mission in life. I remember telling my mother just a few years ago, shortly before she passed away, in February 2020, that uh, even if Baba had never done anything in his life, in any field or sphere, after January 1941, he would still have a very significant place in Indian history because, of course, of the great escape. But Baba didn't see <clears throat> things quite like that. So in addition to pursuing his own family life and his truly glittering career as a medical doctor, a pediatrician, he spent 60 of his 80 years, the 80 years that he lived on this earth, doing Netaji's work. Amarakta kaj kutte parbe? Robibar atui December 
উনিশশো সালে রাঙা কাকাবাবু কুড়ি বছরের শিশিরকে প্রশ্নটা করেছিলেন ওই বেডরুমে বা শোবার ঘরে নেতাজি ভবনের দোতলায় সেই থেকে শিশির বসু সেই শীতের দুপুর শীতের দুপুর ছিল পোস্ট লাঞ্চ আটই ডিসেম্বর উনিশশো ছিল তারিখটা তার কিছুদিন বাদেই ষোলোই সতেরোই জানুয়ারির সেই ঐতিহাসিক রাত্রে মহানিষ্ক্রমণ ঘটে বাবা তারপর থেমে যেতে পারতেন ওটাই যথেষ্ট একজন ঐতিহাসিক ব্যক্তিত্বর মর্যাদা লাভ করার জন্য কিন্তু বাবা জীবনের বাকি ষাটটা বছর শুধু নেতাজির কাজই করে গেলেন লেট মি ইন্ট্রোডিউস আওয়ার স্পিকার ফর টুডে হু উইল ডেলিভার দ্য শিশির কুমার বোস লেকচার Nilanjuna Shengupto is a long-time friend of uh, Netaji Research Bureau um, and I am delighted to welcome her back to Netaji Bhabun. Um, she had a particular connection with my father, which she will tell you herself, uh, so I won't go into that. She was also very good friends with my mother and as you can probably guess she is now very good friends with my brother and myself when i was last in singapore in the month of september 2022 um, i had the opportunity to spend quite a bit of time with nilanjana uh, i had gone there on a one week work trip but it turned into a four week stay for reasons which I will not go into here. But uh, one of the positives of that extended stay was that I got to spend time with some of our dear friends who live in Singapore, including uh, Nilanjana Shengupto. The Shishikumar Bose lecture is taking place after a gap of a few years. <clears throat> We aim to make it an annual event, an occasion, but it doesn't always happen. I think if I'm not mistaken, that the last Shishir Kumar Bose lecture was in 2019, and it was delivered by my colleague from the Department of International History at the London School of Economics, Dr. David Motadel. Nilanjana Shengupto is an, is an alumna of Presidency College. She is also a management graduate, She has been living in Singapore for some years now. Nilanjana is an absolutely prolific author and versatile researcher. She has published numerous books from top academic and popular publishers. And among her many books uh, is The Female Voice of Myanmar, which I personally particularly enjoyed, a deeply researched uh, book. Uh, this book, A Gentleman's Word, The Legacy of Chandra Bose in Southeast Asia, which was published in 2012, And her latest book is called Chickpeas to Cook. It's a fascinating study, which I've read already. It came out a few months ago. It's a fascinating study of the experiences of women in some of the smallest ethnic communities of Singapore. Um, Nilanjana has been associated in various capacities with <clears throat> the National University of Singapore, and especially the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies, uh, ICS, uh, there. Um, please join me in welcoming Nilanjana. Um, Nilanjana will speak on 
legacies of Azad Hind, Netaji, the INA, and the trade union movement in Southeast Asia post-World War II. How the veterans of the Indian National Army who were locally recruited in Singapore and Malaya became the pioneers and the leaders of the post-World War II labor movement in Malaysia and Singapore. And she will bring into the spotlight some notable but largely forgotten figures who, were, who had their political baptism of blood in the Indian National Army and the Azad Hind movement and carried on that revolutionary commitment of serving the people after the Second World War. So please join me in welcoming Nilanjana Shengupto to deliver the Shishir Kumar Bose Lecture 2024. Jai Hind. Good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me. And uh, Nomushkar, it's such a pleasure to be back in my city. Is this loud enough for everyone? OK, I'll try to. OK. Uh, it was lovely to hear the very rousing rendition of the songs that we just heard. And um, I mean, I, I'm just getting goosebumps sitting over here. It's such a privilege to be flanked by these two gentlemen whom I admire so much, Dr. Shugato Bosch and Dr. Shumantra Bosch. And uh, such a privilege to be sitting over here in this house where uh, Netaji, from where he planned his great escape. Um, such a privilege to be actually, you know, in the silent presence of Mrs. Krishna Bose. She was one of the first persons I had interviewed for my book. And she was so enthusiastic and such a friend all along. Um, but if you will allow me a little bit of indulgence, I have a special connection with Dr. Shishir Kumar Bose, like Shumantra mentioned. When I was very little, I had asthma. And along with my mother, I used to uh, visit Dr. Shishir Bose. And I would walk in, and in his very calming, and if I may also add, very handsome presence, I would immediately feel all my ailments leaving me. Um, so, and I think I grew up knowing, and I still know that he was the best doctor in the world. So I feel really touched by this gesture. Uh, of this friend of mine that, you know, I can deliver this lecture in Dr. Shishir Kumar Bose's name. Um, Shumantra has already uh, told you my connection with uh, Subhash Chandra Bose. It is this book, A Gentleman's Worth, The Legacy of Subhash Chandra Bose in Southeast Asia. Um, this was actually my first book. And uh, with this book, it's it has obviously a very special place for me because with this book, my author's journey started. But I think more importantly, it was with this book that my long association with Netaji and the three edicts that he stood for, which, and especially on the day that we are sitting here and whatever is going to happen tomorrow, um, the three edicts that he stood for, the very enlightened sense of secularity, um, the opportunity that he provided to women to be able to be equal partisans in any nationalist movement. And the biggest idea that he stood for, which was of racial and religious equality. So it was with this book that I got to know Netaji. And in knowing him, I got to know the principles that he stood for. So um, this is a very special book for me. And what I would like to say before we move on to the actual topic of conversation today is that in sitting in Singapore, I grew up in Calcutta. I studied at Presidency College, his ex-college as well. But in Singapore, Netaji is such an active present 
presence even today it's really touching you know any family old rooted family that you go to indian family in singapore they invariably have memories of ina and it is not very uncommon to have netaji's pictures with their family photographs on the mantelpiece or in family albums so when i went to southeast asia i think that was my biggest learning that i took away um okay for today's conversation it's a little bit of a longish presentation that i have i'll try to cut it short um it's divided into three phases so the first one in the timeline is from 1930s uh the time when netaji was the president of aituc the all india trade union congress the second one is the period during the war when of course he was there in southeast asia only for a brief while but look at the great aftermath that he left behind he sort of you know changed the whole scenario the whole perspective and the third phase that i'll talk about a little bit is the post war period and uh, that was the time when we see the change that he could bring about the change of perspective of political awareness that he could bring about among um, the very last man perhaps in the indian community um okay now before we start i'll request you to close your eyes for a minute and think about the plantation life that we used to have in southeast asia uh, these were the rubber plantations and you know this was one of the first descriptions i had read uh, when i read this book called jai hind the diary of a rebel daughter with the rani of chansi regiment and uh, there she writes about it was actually published anonymously in 1945 and um, there she writes about this gathering of um, indian independence league there was a speech happening and the workers of the plantation large numbers of them they had gathered around the league worker and they were listening to him very attentively and in the distance you could see their very simple um, hutments where they used to stay the laborers and then there were the rows and rows of symmetrical rubber trees extending into the horizon which virtually cut them off from the world around and while the indian independence league was uh, so the leader was speaking uh, this was in the malay malaya thailand border and while he was speaking it started raining it was a heavy downpour and yet those plantation workers never looked away or never moved away it was almost like they were drinking in every word that he was speaking and then the rain stopped and you know from the rubber trees the water started falling in a very regular pattern and the tap tap of the water could be heard the person who writes the diary says that she was almost being driven frantic by the sound but yet in that gloom the workers kept listening and drew in even closer to the league workers so i think at this point what i can say is that netaji when he came there he was like a messiah who had come to deliver them and i'll go into that a little bit because the large particularly tamil population of plantation workers um the kind of life that they had and netaji coming and talking about worker rights and worker equality was such a epiphanic moment for them so we like i said i'll start a little bit at the beginning um subhash chandra bose i'm sure all of you know his uh, involvement with the trade union started under the political tutelage of chitranjan das and who was also his political guru and of course subhash chandra bose himself became the president in uh, of aituc in 1930 31 
and uh, he was associated with a number of worker associations. I have put up some of the names on the slide that you can see. But I think the biggest takeaway at this point, Subhash Chandra Bose was never involved in the day-to-day -day running of the trade unions. He was never involved in those, you know, the administrative part of it, of course not. What he provided was the bigger picture to the workers. What he spoke about is that yes, your rights and equality is very important, but you can also play a significant role in the economic revival of the country. You can also play a very significant role in the nationalist movement of the country. So right from the beginning, and Subhash Chandra Bose would have been very young at this point, <coughs> we can see that his emphasis all along was on raising the political awareness of the workers. Okay, and um, that's a lovely picture we have over there. And um, Tisco, the trade union of Tisco, was one of the primary trade unions and uh, with which <coughs> Subhash Chandra Bose was very intensely involved. And um, it was at uh, uh, that he participated in a series of negotiations. And um, what we find, again, if we just take a broad eye view of this, is as the management was trying to play off one group of workers against the other, what Subhash Chandra Bose was doing was talking about the importance of worker so solidarity. So what he was trying to do constantly is bring together the, uh, the blue-collared um, non-Bengali, at that point I guess it was mostly the non-Bengali blue-collared workers with the white-collared Bengali workers. Or he was trying to bring in together the left-wingers with the right-wingers. And um, this is in 1929, AITC had its, one of its first splits. And um, uh, at that point, the head of um, the, the more traditional right-wingers, he staged a walkout because the left-wingers were, according to him, getting stronger. And um, this was at the Nagpur, session at Nagpur, I think. And, um, I quote from Subhash Chandra Bose, he said that if they, that is the right wing, believe in democracy, they cannot object to the growing importance of the left wing in the TUC, nor can they grudge the recognition granted to the Kirni Kamgar Union, which was the radical union from Bombay. And then, if you look at the next slide, this is again a little bit later, when he was caught up in a similar crossfire in 1931. And this time, uh, he points a finger at the communists or the radical left-wingers, and he says that um, he's not willing to accept doctrinaire communism. And he's speaking, this is at the Calcutta session, and uh, I think S.V. Deshpande, who was from Bombay, he staged a walkout, and we find Subhash Chandra Bose saying that India should be able to evolve her own methods in keeping with her own needs and her own environment. In applying any theory to practice, you can never rule out geography or history. If you attempt it, you're bound to fail. So again, we see that he was not willing to go with anything that was external to India. He wanted, and he, he, this message, I think he remained quite uniform while speaking to the youth or to the women or to the uh, workers, that the uh, nationalist movement had to come from the grassroots of India. The vision that India has for itself has to be shaped by Indians themselves. It should not be something that comes from a foreign country, be it Russia or China. And now, after spending a little bit of time in Ka our dear old Calcutta, we go to Malaya, and that's a picture that you have. That's a typical plantation, and that's a typical Tamil worker um, who is tapping rubber or latex from the rubber trees. And uh, when this is in the pre-war days, 
Um, it was the worker movement was actually quite at the rudimentary level. And uh, this is 1939, and the person to be remembered, there are few names that are to be remembered. And the main organization is CM, that is the Central Indian Association of Malaya. And some of the important names at this point is um, N. Raghavan. Shumantra said that I'm going to mention some names, you know, who have kind of gotten forgot, have uh, been forgotten in the, um, and been lost in the shadows of Subhash Chandra Bose. So N. Raghavan, he was the president of CM. And then the Selangor State was led by the likes of R. H. Nathan, who was um, the, who was a part of the board of the very famous Tamil Nason local newspaper that was there. And in the Klang district, it was Y.S. Menon and Y.K. Menon. In fact, there are quite a few Menons in that worker movement. And, uh, but the, the part, the point that I want to really emphasize here is that these leaders, be it Nathan or the Menons uh, or Raghavan, they were a part of the English educated elite. And they were, moreover, they were from the Malayali community. And they could not really build a connection with the grassroots level. Like I said, the overarching majority among plantation workers were Tamils. And that is the magic of Subhash Chandra Bose, that he managed, he was no less elite or no less English educated, but he could manage to build that connection with that last man standing in the, um, you know, among the rows of workers. Um, and on the other hand, we have these rubber companies who were making huge amounts of you know, pre-war and during the interim period between the two wars. They were making huge amounts of profits uh, from uh, the sale of rubber, but at the same time, they were holding down the salaries of these plantation workers at a mere 50 cents per day. So that was the situation, and that is the kind of background I'm talking about when I talk about the rubber plantation workers. Um, so uh, the, one of the first strikes that happened was in the Klang district, and it was led by R.H. Nathan. And uh, soon, of course, Raghavan and the other CM leaders stepped in. But though there were protests, what we find is that the District Plan Planting Association of Klang, they just allowed an additional five cents cost of living allowance. That was all they would give in to. And of course, the workers were not satisfied. It was very little, very late. And Nathan continued to talk to the workers. He continued to say that, you know, every time you see a British uh, planter, you don't have to get down from your cycles, or you don't have to be scared of corporal punishment. You don't have to be scared of being uh, replaced by a Javanese or a Chinese worker. But uh, the British, as you can imagine, they came down with a heavy hand, and Nathan was arrested on the 5th of May, 1941. Uh, 300 workers were also arrested. Five of them were even killed, and Raghavan and Y.K. Menon, of course, left for India. They gave it up as a lost cause, and for a while they kind of self-exiled themselves back to India. And um, what we see is that at that point, they failed to forge any connection with the Malayan Communist Party. And that's exactly what will change later on. So now we come to the period for the war. It's that very iconic picture that you see. You see the Japanese soldiers cycling in, you know, into the Malayan Peninsula. That's how they had invaded Malaysia. And um, of course, in the beginning, the Siam leadership, they threw in their lot with Rajbihari Bose, the veteran leader who had started IIL before Subhash Chandra Bose. 
And uh, some of the names of the IIL leaders at that point is N. Raghavan, he had come back. Then there was KPS Menon, like I mentioned, there were quite a few Menons. And S.C. Goho, he's one of the significant Bengali names from this period, he was a lawyer. And um, so, but at the same time, though they joined the Indian Independence League, they were also very suspicious of the connection that Raj Bihari Bose had with the Japanese. Raj Bihari Bose, as we know, he goes back to the Gadar movement of 1915. And since 1915, he had been living in Japan, he had a Japanese wife, and this was what was disturbing the local Indian leadership at that point. And in the East Asia Conference, which was held in Bangkok, 1942, there was a, a collapse of the Indian Independence League, in fact, because of this rift between the local Indian leaders and the Japanese. And um, it was only later that with Subhash Chandra Bose taking over the reins that they would join back um, uh, the provisional government. And of course, I don't know how many of you are aware that initially with the coming of the Japanese, it was a period of chaotic brutality uh, which was unleashed in the plantations and particularly the Chinese community really suffered in their hands. I mean, even after I reached Singapore, which was around 14 years back, you talk to any Chinese family, they remember the Sukchin massacres. They talk about people who had been picked out and brutalized by the Japanese. And um, what was happening all this while in the rubber estates? Well, the British had left. They had um, left some Asian leaders in place who the workers were not willing to accept. And um, also the rubber uh, production levels had gone down drastically. And as a result, a lot of the Tamil workers, they found themselves to be unemployed. And um, so what was happening at this point was the Tamil workers, a lot of them found themselves to be unemployed as well as redundant because they did not have any other skills that they could contribute. And a lot of them were jostled off to the death railway. I mean, we know the stories of death railway. I don't want to go into it. But um, so it was a period of physical and mental degradation for these workers. Now, this is a fantastic picture, and whenever I show this picture on the screen, it fills me with hope and optimism. There we have Subhash Chandra Bose, he has arrived, that's Singapore, he's speaking, um, that's 5th of July 1943, which was such an iconic day, and he's speaking to a great gathering, and even today, if you talk, of course, a lot of the older members have passed away, unfortunately, but... Um, a lot of families have memories of that day. The first day that they witnessed Subhash Chandra Bose speaking. And um, so on one hand, we have the workers who have been going through this period of difficulty. We have, uh, you know, they were rice eating population. They had been told by the Japanese to switch to tapioca. And um, on the other hand, we have the arrival of Subhash Chandra Bose who was hailed as even some newspapers called him Lord Krishna of the time. So uh, there's a brief description in the second quote. Every man and woman in the audience feels that he's talking to him or her in particular. He indulges in no theatricals, no water to be sipped, nobody to fan him, not a scrap of notes to help memory. No fuss, no fluster. That was Subhash Chandra Bose for you. And um, on the 5th of uh, July, actually the fifth and only Indian president of, um, no, sorry, the current president is also Indian, um, uh, S.R. Nathan, he was a boy of just 18 or 19, and I had the privilege of interviewing him while I was writing the book. He was also present, and he talks about his memories of Subhash Chandra Bose. I believe, again, it was a very rainy day, and it started pouring, and people were getting restive. They wanted um, an umbrella. And I believe Subhash Chandra Bose didn't take it too well because he said that if you're getting so restive with a little bit of a drizzle, how do you plan to go and save a country? So that was Netaji for us. 
And um, now what happened to the local leaders at this point? A lot of them, after the coming of Subhash Chandra Bose, a lot of them joined back. Like I said, the IIL had actually fallen through, but a lot of them joined back. And what was more striking, and that is, I think, the most important part of the legacy that he left behind, that, you know, it was a coming together of the entire hierarchy of um, leadership and rank and file workers. So what we find, if you look at the IIL at this point, the hierarchical structure, we have on top the English educated elite, like the Raghavans and the SC Gohos that I spoke about. And then at the middle level, we have, um, you know, the Kanganis, the, the labor agents who were there. We have the uh, school teachers. We have the middle level um, semi-educated people and then we have the rank and file of the workers who were made up of actual plantation labor hands. So it was a coming together, it was a very powerful alchemy of coming together unlike you know where in the plantations they would be completely cut off from the world this is where their political awareness started when they could be educated on the history of india on the history of various political movements which had shaken up the world before so they and i have interviewed these people they talk about for example the um, the the night school that used to happen, you know, Balak Sena and Balika Sena, all the little kids had joined. And even they have memories of the night schools where various um, political movements would be discussed or taught to them. They would also be taken through presentations on what religion is, what is caste, what is poverty, all of that, you know. So whereas earlier, each plantation was an isolated world in itself. It was in the IIL and of course with the INA that the entire community had a way of coming together, had a way of interacting. So when I was talking about it earlier, I had said that you know the, the English educated elite leaders, they were cut off from the grassroots, but this is where they actually came together. Um, and of course, one of the important names, uh, so with this slide, we come to the post-war period. And one of the important names is MPAJA, which is the uh, Malayan People's Anti-Japanese Army. And like I had said, again, if you connect it back, that previously there were no connections which could be forged with the Chinese workers. But it was in the post-war period that we find there is some kind of Indian um, and Chinese uh, worker connection that is developing. And that is primarily because the, by now the Chinese Communist Party had already been founded in the 1930s. They, the Malayan Peninsula was completely taken over by the MPAJA. And they were, the, they were the army that the British had been supporting all along. So they had access to arms and ammunition. And um, this was the connection that the INA soldiers, the veterans took advantage of, and they also forged a link with them. And uh, now the MPAJ, the Chinese, mostly Chinese, they had aided the British in a war against the Japanese and would eventually go on to attempt a red revolution against the British as well. So it was kind of uh, 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 similar to what was happening in Burma, if you um, are aware of the Burmese history. And then this is what was happening to the INA in the post-war period. Well, as we all know, the war ended quite abruptly in 1945 with the uh, bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I have spoken to INA veterans. Actually, the person I spoke to, because I reached quite late, he was from Balaksena. So he had told me that he had called up his father that, you know, I need over, so what do I do? He was a textile trader. 
and uh, his father had just said to just go back to work and say, keep sending me money. So it was an end of an era for the INA soldiers. And in this, uh, during this time of confusion, a lot of the INA soldiers, as we know, they were detained at various intern meant camps and you know a lot of them also would be repatriated to India and um, this was also a time when the Malayan Peninsula was completely taken over by the Chinese and so it was at this time and the place to remember is the squatter, co squatter colonies you know these colonies which had developed near the industrial townships or on the fringes of the plantations which were mostly uh, where you know the MPAJ had taken shelter during the war and now the British after the British came back the INA having been disbanded a lot of the INA vets also found their way there and together with the MPAJ they kind of revived a lot of the general labor unions at this point and um, what was happening here was the INA men saw this as a continuation of their struggle against the British and um, they kind of as a result forged an alliance with the communists while for the MCP that is the Malayan Communist Party the INA personnel they were indoctrinated in anti-British ideology and were very attractive candidates for uh, recruitment. And um, so we find during the post-war period, a lot of the INA sold uh, personnel, they took the lead in forming the Indian sections of the general labor unions. And finally, there was some kind of uh, solidarity which emerged between the Chinese and the Indian workers. And um, there were a lot of independent labor unions were set up in every district. And some of the names that we might want to remember were um, Keda and Sembilan. There was this person called MCP Menon from the INA who would you know, garner a great deal of support from uh, uh, laborers and particularly women as well. And there were two other names, H.K. Chaudhary and P.P. Narayan. Both of them were again English speaking former members of the INA who emerged as um, Indian labor leaders of the Negri Sembilan district. Uh, this picture, very significant, uh, this is of A.M. Sami. He, he was never a part of the INA actually, but he was very much politically aware and his political awareness had grown because of his involvement with the INA, um, uh, you know, the, the speeches and the shows that they would have. And um, he was actually, he is significant because he is one of the names who emerged from the absolute uh, grassroots level. He was a lorry driver and he came back to Kedah after um, the war was over and he found that the world of the plantation had completely changed. Whereas earlier they were, the workers were very servile to the British now they were not willing to accept the British uh, authority again and the British were really struggling to maintain the very strictly regimented hierarchy that they would they had before the war and um, so Sammy actually uh, he set about re-establishing a civilian vigilance group that he used to have and he called it the Thoda Pedai which is the Tamil name for the laborers militia. And um, initially, of course, he would work with the British to kind of maintain um, discipline at religious functions. But then toddy, the drinking of toddy became a very important issue at this point. Just as, you know, opium was being sold at, um, uh, Dutch or British colonies, toddy was yet another uh, drink that was popular and was sold despite the protest from workers. It was sold at plantations 
because it was a way of keeping them quiet. And so uh, uh, it was A.M. Sami who started the uh, trade union at the Harvard estate. And he, this was primarily to stop the uh, reopening of the toddy shops. And we soon find that he had a following, on, following of around 1,500 men. And the interesting part is they continued to wear the INA uniform. By now, it was starting to look quite battered. But they continued to wear their INA caps. And they had these you know, wooden uh, replicas of uh, firearms which they would carry and they would kind of you know march around their state just in a show of defiance to the British and um, unfortunately of course A.M. Sami was not successful though he continued to garner a lot of support and he had around 13,000 laborers from Kedah who became a part of his um, union of the Kedah union uh, but the British came down with a heavy hand, and uh, it did not take, the, take long for them to be uh, kind of Sami to be arrested and, the, and his followers to be moved out of the way. But what is interesting at this point is that though A.M. Sami was arrested, the movement did not stop. One part of it is that A.M. Sami was not the educated elite, and yet he had the defiance and the courage to st stand up against the British. And even after he was arrested, it did not mean the end of the worker movement. There were others who, the youngsters and the INA veterans who came and you know continued with it. So it was something that the British had to contend with for the next uh, two centuries, uh, two decades or so. Uh, and then we have the, uh, another very important name who was actually, unlike A.M. Sami, I said he was not from INA. There was the INA veteran, S.A. Ganpati, and he was accused, uh, he would form a trade union, and he was accused of carrying arms, and he was sentenced to death. And he was uh, hanged at the Pudu jail in 1949. And this is, again, a very legendary figure. Uh, families keep to, still talk about him and how there had been various pleas for you know, clemency being sent for him by the Indian leaders across organizations. But the British had been adamant in putting him to death. And, um, but even then, even after leaders like S.A. Ganpati were hanged, that's the interesting part, that the movement did not really s stop. And we find that by the 1950s, estate workers were not compelled to dismount from their bicycles uh, when a manager passed by or were not at least subjected to physical assault. And uh, by 1948, of course, emergency would be declared in Malaya and uh, the counter-communist insurgency would continue till through the 1950s. Um, that's actually my last slide. I, and uh, the movement is not complete if I don't talk about James Puthucherry. Again, his family members, I had the opportunity of interviewing while I was in Malaysia. And um, he had been an INA loyalist, and later he actually crossed over to join the worker movement in Singapore. And um, what is James Puthucherry's history? He was just 20, and he had just completed his secondary education when he joined the INA. And uh, he was part of the guerrilla outfit of the 3rd Regiment of India's first, uh, INA's first division, the Azad Brigade, commanded by Gulzara Singh, and uh, which, as we all know, it played a very important role in the Imphal Kohima uh, offensive. And uh, he was also the person who was a part of INA's very debilitating retreat from Burma. In fact, he was the only person who had survived in his platoon. I believe the others had fallen during the retreat. And uh, it was in 1955 
that he was appointed one of the secretaries of the Singapore Factory and Shop Workers Union that was the largest trade union of Singapore and he came to he was a lawyer and an economist and he came to res, uh, res represent the intellectual left of Malayan nationalism and later on he would also be one of the founding members of um, the People's Action Party, which as we all know is still holds power in Singapore. It was Lee Kuan Yew who, you know, kind of forged Singapore into and nurtured the country into what it has become today. And, uh, but as far as James Puthucherry is concerned, in fact, I forgot to mention he had escaped to uh, Calcutta and he spent a long period of time with Shorod Bose. And uh, I believe uh, Shorod Bose had organized for his education at Shantaniketan. And um, so uh, Puthucherry, of course, later he would uh, break away from PAP and join the opposition. And in 1963, he would be arrested uh, in what was called the Operation Cold Store. Even today in Singapore, uh, I mean, they, it's spoken about in whispered tones because uh, it was the Operation Cold Store which took care of, in the name of communists, it actually took care of all kinds of opposition. And um, after that, of course, uh, Mr. Puthucherry would move to um, Malaysia. And that's where he passed away. And uh, so to come to my conclusion, um, I think historians remain divided in their opinion on the true cause of the communist insurrection in Malaya. Uh, some feel that the Malayan uprising was a part of the concerted communist revolt that had rocked India, Burma, Indonesia, and the Philippines at that time. Others feel it was inherent in the political awakening and physical hardships of the time. Um, as far as the Indian community goes, I would feel that perhaps it was a combination of both these causes. And um, definitely it was the coming together was catalyzed by the INA, by the anti-British indoctrination and um, the sense of nationalist pride that it could ignite among the Indians. Um, what we find is that during the emergency, the Indian estate workers would again be you know, forcibly regrouped into more centralized labor lines and again be isolated from the, ins uh, the influence of the communist trade unions. Um, but on the flip side, I think it was also that the strikes that had started and the, you know, the trade union movement was taking the country on a ransom. And uh, Subhash Chandra Bose himself had experienced this when he had said that uh, the communists had become a serious menace to the growth of healthy trade unionism in India. So something very similar was actually happening in Southeast Asia as well. And, but whatever, that is something that um, historians will look at and decide. But what we see is that with the INA and the spread of the Indian of Indian nationalism, the archetypal Ramaswamy of the Malayan estates had gained a new voice. And Indian political opinion had traveled far beyond the elite and the bourgeoisie, and it had reached the laboring multitude. Thank you so much. Uh, before I turn it over to Shugoto Bose, chairperson of Netaji Research Bureau, for a short comment uh, from his historian uh, perspective, um, I'd like to say that um, <clears throat> clearly the impact of Netaji and the Azad Hind movement was seismic on Indian and Indian origin communities throughout Southeast Asia, but it was probably the strongest in Malaya, Malaysia and Singapore, because that was the epicenter of the movement. Shishir Bose, uh, who was frankly obsessed with his uncle, um, 
had a forensic interest in discovering and documenting every aspect of Netaji's life and struggle. <clears throat> and I think he would be very happy today. Uh, probably his spirit roams around you know, these precincts, um, unseen by us, but very much present. He would be very happy today, uh, Ninanjuna, with how meticulously and clearly you have recorded that that seismic impact lasted long beyond 1945 in the countries of Southeast Asia. Uh, as for my mother, uh, Krishna Bose, she too would be very happy that you came here today and delivered the Shishir Bose lecture. And I must say that you have some of her talent, her knack of couching very serious history lessons in a storytelling style, her signature storytelling style, so that serious material becomes accessible and interesting to all. Um, I'll turn it over to uh, Professor Shugata Bose at this stage uh, for, uh, for a short comment, response, and uh, um, uh, uh, maybe you can, uh, maybe you can tell them uh, the story you heard from Eric Stokes about his experience in Kuala Lumpur, I believe, at the end of World War II in Asia in 1945. Uh, thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Nilanjana. Uh, for this uh, wonderful uh, Shishir Kumar Bose lecture. In fact, I was just going to say uh, what Shumantra has already said, that you have a delightful uh, storytelling style, uh, which uh, my mother would have truly appreciated and uh, been proud of. I think this was a very important lecture for a very long time, as a historian, I have been trying to urge the younger generation to look at the role of uh, INA veterans in the post-war labor movement. If you read, uh, if I may borrow Ranajit Goha's phrase, the prose of counterinsurgency, you would imagine that the resistance against the British in the late 40s and 50s was mono-ethnic in composition. That it was no more than a conspiracy hatched by Chinese communists. And uh, Anthony Short wrote an entire book uh, on this subject. He was a British intelligence officer the British imposed an emergency in colonial Malaya in 1948, which was not lifted until 1960, three years after Medeka or freedom was achieved. But more discerning historians who have read the prose of counterinsurgency against the grain and also have begun to look at other types of sources and you know, you have done some excellent oral history with figures like uh, James Puthiacheri, for example. That shows us that between late 1945 and 1949, there was an open labor movement. And the largest organization at that time was the pan Malay Federation of Trade Unions. And that organization had Chinese, Indian, and Malay participation, as well as Chinese, Indian, and Malay leadership. And two of the top-ranking Indian leaders of this Federation of Trade Unions were executed by the, the British. The other perspective that you have you know, brought to bear 
in the course of your lecture is how anti-colonial nationalists had to address the problem of racial relations. You have talked about Malaya in the main today, and you have told us how in fact challenging it was to bring the Malays and the Indians, the working class, onto the same platform. And that is partly because the beginnings of this movement goes back to the onset of the Great Depression, a global economic crisis. And at that time, many Tamil workers who were thrown out of work in their rubber plantations were able to come back to India. But there were many Chinese workers in the tin mines who could not return to the Chinese provinces, which were deeply troubled at that time. And the Malayan Communist Party was formed in 1930, and these Chinese workers had become squatters on government land. In Malaya, the British separated the commercial and the subsistence sectors, and non-Malays were not supposed to be able to buy Malay land on which they were supposed to grow rice. It was quite the opposite in Burma. There, you know, non-Burmese could buy a land, and what happened in Burma with the onset of the Great Depression was that huge quantities of land passed from Burmese peasant hands into the hands of Indian, mostly Chettia Tamil moneylenders. And that's why in 1930, up to 1932, you have the great peasant uprising led by a Buddhist monk, Sayasan, which was both anti-British and anti-Indian in character. So Netaji Shubhashtandra was faced this huge challenge, which he met with significant success. In Burma, what is striking is that between 1943 and 1945, race relations between the Indians and the Burmese were on an even keel, despite the conflicts of the earlier decade, the 1930s. And Netaji played a huge role in ensuring that relations would be good between Indians and Burmese, and both Bamo and Aung San acknowledged Netaji's great contribution in that regard. This despite the fact that the Indian independence movement in Burma, including the Azad Hind government, was much better off economically. There was the Azad Hind Bank than the Burmese government in Burma, not least because Indian benefactors came forward and contributed to the Azad Hind movement. And uh, today we have uh, in the audience, in the first row, uh, Umar Habib Sahab, who is the grandson of Abdul Habib Sahab, a Gujarati Muslim, who had contributed a crore of rupees to the Azad Hind movement in 1944. And, uh, and he will be with us on the 23rd of January as well. So these were the kinds of challenges. And even in Malaya, Netaji tried to make sure that there was some kind of a, a communication with the leaders of the MPAJA. And that is why, in the post-war period, it was possible uh, for the Indian and the Chinese labor leaders to cooperate with, uh, with, with one another. So this is a very important facet of uh, South Asian and Southeast Asian history that you have brought to the fore today, uh, Nilanjana, and I would like to congratulate you very warmly. But let me end my brief comment uh, with a story that my a PhD supervisor, Eric Stokes, told me soon after I arrived in Cambridge. He first came to India during the Second World War, 
And just after the war ended, uh, he was sent to Malaya. And he said that in Kuala Lumpur, he saw that there were a large number of INA prisoners being taken in lorries to be to their camps. And he saw that the crowds were coming out into the streets of Kuala Lumpur and shouting Netaji Zindabad and cheering the prisoners. And that had, as he put it, a completely demoralizing effect on the Indians who were being officered by the British to take these INA prisoners along. He also told me that he was given the responsibility, along with two other young British officers, of escorting three INA officers who were prisoners from Calcutta to Delhi. Not the famous Red Fort Three, but three others. And he said that it had been arranged uh, that uh, the train would pass the major cities of North India at night, but those who were in the railways were in the know, and therefore the train passed all the major cities during the day, and at every railway station, huge crowds gathered, and he said that he saw the prisoners were being cheered, and he told me I was clutching at my pistol, knowing that I wouldn't be able to do anything if the crowds who had come to cheer the INA prisoners turned hostile. So this was, you know, the kind of spirit uh, that, of the INA that was evident both in post-war Malaya and in post-war India. I think, um, you know, we talked about Nozrul on the 14th of uh, uh, January in the context of Deshobondhu. And uh, we might want to close today with an impromptu song, if Srimati Mollik will help a little bit uh, on, uh, with the uh, harmonium. Uh, I just want to also add, in terms of music, Durgamogiri Kantar Moru was taught by Netaji himself to the leading figures of the Rani of Jhansi Regiment. And when Shishir Kumar Bose and Krishna Bose went to East and Southeast Asia in 1979, and they met Janaki Thevar Athina Happan in uh, uh, Kuala Lumpur, she sang Durgamogiri Kantar Muru for them at the reception. And of course, we know that uh, Netaji had uh, also taught uh, the younger members of the Bose family, uh, Kararoi Loho Kopat, uh, in, uh, after he was released from uh, prison in, in Mandalay. <clears throat> now, the reason why I want to end with this is a, is a very famous, possibly the most popular song of Nosrul. Uh, and you can sing it sitting in your chairs. Um, you will know the first verse, all of you. But I'm, I'm ch choosing to uh, perform this song despite the terrible condition of my throat today because of uh, what is anticipated to happen tomorrow. Nozrul of course, was our revolutionary poet who composed so many patriotic songs. But he also wrote beautiful devotional songs, odes to Kali, Krishna, we now know, also to Ram, but also odes to the Muhammad, Allah. And in terms of cultural symbols, you know, he was a true Bengali, and therefore he could draw or every religious or cultural tradition with which he was familiar. <clears throat>
Unfortunately, this very popular song used to sung, be sung in full, I understand, in the pre-1947 period. But somehow, the second half of the song has got somewhat forgotten. And uh, that is the part which I would ask you to listen to uh, a bit carefully. Chal, 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 chal Urdha kagane baje ma dal, nimne utala dharani tal Oruno prater toruno dal, chal re chal re chal Chal re chal re chal, 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 chal Urdha kagane baje ma dal, nimne utala dharani tal Oruno prater toruno dal, chal re chal re chal चाल रे चाल रे चाल उषार दुआरे हमी आघात आम्रा आमी बोराना प्रभात आम्रा टूटा बोती मेरो रात बाधरो बिंधा चाल उषार दुआरे हमी आघात आम्रा आमी बोराना प्रभात आम्रा टूटा बोती मेरो रात बाधरो बिंधा चाल नबो नो बीनेर गाही आगान शाजी बिकोरी बो महाशशान आम्रा दानी बो नुतानो प्राण बाहुते नो बीनो बाल नबो नो बीनेर गाही आगान शाजी बिकोरी बो महाशशान आम्रा दानी बो नुतानो प्राण बाहुते नो बीनो बाल चल रे नौ जवान शोन रे पाती आकान चल रे नौ जवान शोन रे पाती आकान मृत्यु तोरन दुआरे दुआरे जीवने रावण मृत्यु तोरन दुआरे दुआरे जीवने रावण भांग रे भांग पागोल चल रे चल रे चल भांग रे भांग पागोल चल रे चल रे चल 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 उर्ध्व गागोने बाजे मादल निम्ने उतला धारनी ताल ओरुनो प्रातेरे तोरुनो दाल चल रे चल रे चल उर्धे आदेश हमी छे बाज शहीदी इधरे शेनारा शाज दिके दिके चले कुछ कावाज खोल रे नीद महाल उर्धे आदेश हमी छे बाज शहीदी इधरे शेनारा शाज दिके दिके चले कुछ कावाज खोल रे नीद महाल कबे शेखो आली बाद शाही शेइशे ओतिते आजो चाही जाश मोसा फिर गान गाही थैलिशे ओस रुजाल कबे शेखो आली बाद शाही शेइशे ओतिते आजो चाही जाश मोसा फिर गान गाही थैलिशे ओस रुजाल जाकरे तक ताऊस जागरे जाग बेहोस जाकरे तक ताऊस जागरे जाग बेहोस डूबिलो रे देख कतो पारोशो कतो रोम ग्रीक रूश डूबिलो रे देख कतो पारोशो कतो रोम ग्रीक रूश जागिलो तारा शकोल जगे ओठीन बाल जागिलो तारा शकोल जगे ओठीन बाल आम्रा गोरी बो नो तुन कोरिया धुलाए ताज महाल आम्रा गोरी बो नो तुन कोरिया धुलाए ताज महाल चाल 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 उर्ध्व कागों ने बाजे मा दाल निम्ने उतला धारनी ताल ओरुनो प्रातेरे तोरुनो दाल चाल रे चाल रे चाल चाल रे चाल रे चाल 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 May I close the evening by thanking you all for coming and inviting you most cordially to our events right here on Netaji's 127th birth anniversary, the day after tomorrow, 23rd January 2024. Uh, in the morning, uh, we have the traditional Netaji birthday assembly at 10.30 a.m. Um, there will be an illustrated lecture by Professor Shugoto Bose titled Netaji's Vision of Asia, 
Netaji's vision of Asia, of Asiatic unity and Asian solidarity. Uh, there will also be, as always, a birthday concert, which will be performed this year by a troupe of folk artists from the villages of Murshidabad and Nodia in Bengal. Uh, they are exponents of Bangla Kawali, and they are led by two singers in particular. There will be eight or nine of them on stage. They are led by two singers, Chote Golam Fakir and Babu Fakir. And uh, <clears throat> the birth anniversary number of Netaji Research Bureau's own in-house journal, The Oracle, which Dr. Shishibo started, like everything else, here in uh, the year 1979, will be released. I should also mention that in the morning assembly, um, which will start at 10.30 a.m., we will have two very special guests present, uh, one of whom is already here today, uh, Mr. Omar Habib of uh, Rangoon, uh, who will be rejoining us um, day after tomorrow in the morning. Um, he is the younger son of uh, a legendary Mr. Habib, who donated his entire considerable fortune, worth over rupees one crore at the time, in 1943-1944, to the Azad Hind struggle, and then joined the Indian National Army. And in addition to Mr. Omar Habib, we will also have with us uh, Bharati, also known as Asha, Bharati Chaudhuri Sahai, uh, the daughter of Anand Mohan Sahai, who was one of Netaji's close companions in struggle during World War II in Southeast Asia. And Bharati Chaudhuri Sahai um, is a 95-year-old, a 95-year-old veteran of the Rani of Jhansi Regiment of the Indian National Army. She has recently published a book based on her experiences at the time called The War Diaries of Asha Sun, um, based on a diary she kept from 1943 until 1947. Uh, in the evening, um, Netaji Research Bureau was established by Dr. Shishir Bose as not an institute of history, but as an institute of history, politics, and international affairs. You know, that was the, the mandate he gave it. Uh, at 6 p.m. in this space, once again, we will have the fourth Krishna Bose lecture delivered, to be delivered, by Professor Dominic Levin, formerly a colleague of mine at the London School of Economics, who is a truly world-renowned authority on Russian modern history and politics. And he will be delivering the fourth Krishna Bose lecture at six o'clock here in this space at Netaji Bhabon on Netaji's birth anniversary on a very topical, if depressing subject, Russia and Ukraine, past, present, and future. Russia and Ukraine, past, present, and future. So please join us day after tomorrow in the evening for that lecture as well. There's one final ritual before we adjourn, and that is the gifting of two books uh, to uh, Nilanjana Shingupta as, uh, as a token of gratitude. Uh, um, uh, one of them is the English version uh, one of them is the English version published in 2016 of Shishir Kumar Bose's 1980s Bengali classic, Boshubari. And it was published about seven and a half years ago in its English version, belatedly, as Shubhash and Sharut. And the other is also uh, is, is a new-ish volume well, uh, it was published on the occasion of Netaji's 125th and India's 75th, and it's 
the nationally best-selling compilation of Krishna Bose's articles, uh, some of her best writings on Netaji, the INA, and the struggle for India's freedom. So Nilanjuna, you have uh, a book each by, uh, by uh, your favorite people, uh, Shishir Bose and Krishna Bose. Uh, thank you again for coming. Jai Hind. Uh, uh, group would like to present Netaji Research Bureau uh, with their uh, calendar for 2024. Uh, may I ask uh, Shomrita Mullik to present a calendar each to Professor Shugato Bose and to Nilanjana uh, Shengupta. And if you have a spare one, I will take one as well. <laughs> and the theme of the calendar is uh, Nozrul's famous song, Kararui Loho Kapat, Bhenge Phal Korre Lopat. Bhangar Ganer Shatobosho, Upolokhe. Jai Hind.